Welcome to another experience with the Methodist Voices in Word and Song television ministry. We are so happy you could join us. Today is the last Lord's Day after Pentecost and the beginning of Ministries and Youth Month. Please have your hymnals and Bibles ready as we celebrate in word and song. I am Josette Francis Wint, a member of the Beachamville Bensonton Circuit, and I'll be your liturgist for today. The message will be brought to us by Reverend Halton Hill, one of the ministers serving in the Western St. Andrews Circuit. We're truly delighted to have him deliver the message today. Each Lord's Day at 1.30 p.m., when we gather online, we can make the worship experience more meaningful by resisting the urge to engage in other tasks while we worship, and where possible, to give full attention to God and so receive the blessings reserved for you and your loved ones. The introit, His Name is Wonderful, number 43 in the Voices in Praise. The call to worship. Brothers and sisters, we are loved by God and chosen by the Lord Jesus. We have turned from idols to serve the living and the true God. We are approved by God and entrusted with his gospel. Our hope and our joy is to glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. As we worship together, may the Lord make our love increase. May he strengthen our hearts so we shall be blameless and holy. May God himself, the God of peace, make us holy through and through. The one who calls us is faithful. He will do it. The opening hymn, Tell me the old, old story, number 94 in the Voices in Praise.
prayer of adoration. Almighty God, we bless your name. We worship you as the all-knowing God and glorify you as our ever-present Father. We reverence you as the God who restores. We exalt you. We say hallelujah to our God who fulfills his purpose in our lives. May your name be glorified in and through this or act of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The commandments of our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. And a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these your laws in our hearts, we beseech you. Let us confess our sins to God and pray for forgiveness. Or prayer of confession. You gave your life for me. What have I given for you? Forgive us, God, for our pursuit of vain things. Things that don't last are in the end consumed as with fire. You served us unto the death and commanded us to do likewise, to serve each other and pursue the lost with your love. Like your weary followers, the cares of this life drain us and we fail to tarry with you. Forgive us, Lord, for the flesh is often weak, though our spirits are willing. Strengthen us, and we will be strengthened. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. The Assurance of Pardon through the abundance of God's mercy and forgiving love, you have pardoned from your sins and you are empowered to be disciples, to reach out to others, to offer the words and deeds of hope in a struggling world. God's blessings are poured over you for this service. Amen. Thank you for your grace or prayer of thanksgiving. Father, thank you for the testimony of your faithfulness and goodness that we have in the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your loyal love and compassion that stocks our cupboards with everything we need to live a life that pleases and serves you. Thank you for forgiving us for the ways we have knowingly or unknowingly rebelled against your truth. Resurrect the grand visions for our individual lives that you have crafted just for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Holy Spirit,
Let your power fall. Let your voice be heard. Come and change our hearts as we stand on your word. Holy continues to hide us in the shadow of his rock. And so we're going to put our hands together as we sing. In the rock I'll hide in the shadow now move into the ministry of the word. The collect for the day. Eternal, Eternal God, God, enable us by your grace to live for you day by day. 
May we run the race before us, ever looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, that when he shall come again to judge the living and the dead, we shall be prepared for his coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Old Testament lesson will be read for us today by Sister Cecile Davis. The Old Testament lesson comes to us today from Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 to 16 and 20 to 24. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with their horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged and I will judge between sheep and sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsive reading is taken from Psalm 100, number 558 in the Voices in Praise. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For, For the, the Lord, Lord is good. good. His, his steadfast love endures forever. forever. And, and his faithfulness to, to all, all generations. generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our epistle will be read for us by Sister Barbara Hilton. The epistle is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 reading from verse one to eight. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, 
not to please mortals, but to please God, who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The hymn, Thy Life Was Given For Me, number 219 in the Voices in Praise. The Gospel will be read for us by Reverend Halton Hill. The Gospel reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, reading from verse 31 to verse 46. Glory to you, O God. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that, you, that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into eternal fire, prepared for the devils and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. They will also answer, Lord, when, it, when was it that we saw you hungry? or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of Christ. Praise be to Christ, O Lord. message today will be brought to us by Reverend Halton Hill from the Western St. Andrew Circuit. Today's text is taken from 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4 and verse 8. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Brethren, we are still in the season of what I call so what. We're in the season of what's next. Jesus, you gave your life for me. What have I given for thee? Jesus, you left all for me. What have I left for thee? Jesus, thou sufferest all for me. What have I borne for thee? Jesus, great gifts thou broughtest for me, what have I brought to thee? Jesus, you gavest thyself for me, may I give myself to thee as my reasonable response to the one who gave all for me. Brethren, those who know me well know I have an affinity or a love for sports, an affinity for all sorts of sports, basketball, football, athletics, are among my favorites. Those who know me well know that I even played a number of sports in my school years. And sports is a metaphor for life. Sports is a metaphor for the Christian life. And sports teaches us many useful things. Sports teaches us to persevere and to be determined. It teaches us that we will face opposition and adversity. And that we must press through despite opposition. Press through despite adversity. That we'll not win every battle, and we won't win every contest, but we must get up again to fight another day. Sports teaches us discipline, discipline to train, discipline not to take certain things into our body, 
and to deny ourselves of other things. Sports teach us how to cooperate with others, to learn to work as a team for a common goal and a common objective. Paul reveals in his, that his proclamation of the gospel message faced great opposition, great hostility, great antagonism, great conflict, great persecution. Having fed, fled Philippi because of great hostility and great antagonism, he arrives in the land of the Thessalonians and it's as if he was jumping out of the fire pan and into the fire. For Paul faces hostility and antagonism and conflict among the Thessalonians as well. After three weeks of preaching and teaching in their synagogues, the opposition rose up and rose up to a boil, so to speak. It climaxes and Paul has to retreat again. He says to the, to the Thessalonians, I desperately wanted to stay and establish your faith. I wanted to share the gospel of Christ further with you. He desperately wanted to stay, but he thought it was wiser to leave his heroes and to depart the city. Paul wanted to come back and he made many attempts to come back. But he said, Satan, the chief opponent of the things of God, prevented him. Paul desperately wanted to stay. He desperately wanted to come back. But opposition arose and prevented same. What can we glean from this, our text? Lesson number one. If we're going to achieve anything good in the kingdom of God, our nose has to run. We need to learn to work hard. We need to learn to persevere. For opposition will come. Men and women will oppose us. Our own flesh will oppose us. Satan, the chief opponent of the gospel, will oppose us. Our walk with God is like a sport. It's like a great contest and the stakes are high. And our opponents are good at what they do. And our opponents desperately want to win. And so we need to be equal to the task. We need to expect that opposition not may come, but will come. But you may ask the question, Pastor, the gospel message is good news. Doesn't the gospel message teach us and instruct us how we can experience eternal life in God? Doesn't the gospel message teach us and instruct us how we can experience full life in God? Joy and peace and contentment and righteousness in the Holy Ghost? Why would anyone oppose life? Why would anyone oppose joy and peace and contentment in the Holy Ghost? Why would anyone oppose good news? The truth is that the gospel message, though it is good news for those who are being saved, good news and the power of salvation for those who are being saved, it is foolishness to those who are perishing. Life and power of God for those being saved, but rubbish to those who are being lost. For some who are perishing, the gospel sounds too good to be true. All I've known in my life, pastor, is pain and despair and suffering. But you want me to believe that better can come? You want me to believe that I can experience joy? You want me to believe that I can experience peace? All I've known in my life is hate and you're telling me that I can experience love. All I've been yearning for is contentment and satisfaction and they've eluded me. And you want me to believe that I can have contentment and satisfaction in my life? For some, they reject the gospel message because it sounds too good to be true. For others, the gospel message is an offense because the gospel message causes us to call into question our previously held assumptions, to call into question our previously held beliefs. The gospel message invites us to repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, which means to change one's mind which means to part with some of my previously held assumptions and beliefs about what is true about life and about God. The gospel message invites me to admit that there's something amiss, that there's something wrong with my previously held assumptions about life and truth. In order to experience healing and new life, I first have to admit that I'm sick. In order to experience healing and new life, I first have to admit that I'm a sinner. We have to admit that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And we have to let go of our stubborn pride and ask for help. I don't know about you, but I know some people who struggle with asking for help. Who hate to ask for help. They'd rather die first than ask for help. Because asking for help makes them feel small. Asking for help makes them feel needy. 
Brethren, whether we're teaching Sunday school, whether we're in the choir, our Christian life will bring opposition. For the message of the cross is life and power of God for those who are being saved, but foolishness to those who are perishing. If it is so hard, though, why should we do it? Why should we invest so much? Why should we give up so much? Is it really worthy? Is it really worth it after all? Is it worth the sacrifice? Is it worth the investment? Is it worth the fight? Brethren, professional athletes put up and have to discipline themselves. They put up with a lot of things. They have to deny themselves of certain things. Professional athletes have to put up with losses and opposition. And the sweat and the pain, they go through it because they know at the end of the day, many of them can earn salaries that can impact generations. They can earn generational wealth that will not only impact them and their children, but even their grandchildren. But why should we, the proclaimers of the gospel message, endure and put up with opposition and put up with trials? Why did Paul endure such persecution and suffering? Why did he endure being imprisoned? Why did he endure being hated and reviled upon? Why did he endure false accusation and lies? Wouldn't it have been easier for Paul to just mind his own business? Wouldn't it have been easier for Paul to live a, a normal life? Why would he endure so much for the sake of the gospel? And why should we? What is clear is that Paul was all in. What is clear is that Paul was fully invested in the cause of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. In sports, we have a number of players or participants, so to speak. We have the persons who own the teams or the franchises. We have those who play the game, the members of the team. There are coaches, there are trainers. There are persons who help the members of the team to perform optimally. But there are also fans who support their respective teams. And as I contemplated this message, a thought came to me. What is the difference between a fan and a member of the team? Both the fan and the team member are invested in their teams, especially the diehard fans, not the dry weather fans. The, the diehard fans stick with their teams through thick and thin. They're invested. They attend the games. They buy the tickets. They watch the games on TV and other platforms. They buy the merchandise. They're all in with their teams. In fact, some of them don't want to say they. They say ours and we and, and mine. But they're not fully invested like those who are members of the team. They invest money, yes. They invest time, yes. But they don't invest their hopes and dreams in their team's success. Many of them are so invested, that those who are in the fans, that they use the first person. But they're not as invested as those on the team. They watch from the sidelines. They're not in the heat of the battle. They're not in the heat of the contest. They are mired from afar. They attend the games. Yes, they cheer on their team. Yes. But they don't put their bodies at risk to help the team to win or to achieve success. Many of us profess love for Jesus. We attend church. Yes. We're invested to an extent. Yes. But we choose to admire from afar. We're fans. We're not fully invested. But God is not looking for fans as much as God is looking for persons who would sign up and be members of the team. And guess what? The members of the team are the ones who are on the payroll. The fans are not on the payroll. And so let us understand that the gospel work, there is, there is a payment, there is a reward for those who invest themselves in the gospel work. Peter said, we have left everything to follow you. Truly said Jesus, I tell you, no one who has left homes, our brothers, our sisters, our mother, our father, our children, our field, for me and the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge shall give to me on that day. And not only for me, but for all those who long for his appearing. 
Brethren, there is a reward for those who are all in. There's a reward for those who are fully invested in the things of God. There's a reward in this life, and there's a reward in the life to come. But was there anything else that was motivating the Apostle Paul? Should there be anything else that should motivate us as we seek to proclaim the gospel and to do the gospel work? Paul said, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. Paul was driven by a desire to please God, to please the one who gave all for him. To please the one who pursued him when he was on the road to Damascus to destroy the people of God and to destroy the church. To please the one who showed him mercy. To please the one who, sh who changed his life. May we know the one who was all in for us that we may go all in for him. May we know how much he sacrificed for us so we would sacrifice for him. May we know the one who was fully invested in us that we may be fully invested in in him. If we're going to be faithful, if we're going to press through opposition and persecution, we have to have pure motives. We have to have correct motives. And Paul was driven by his motivation to, to please and to love God. But Paul was also driven by a deep love for people. Paul said, so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Paul had strong affections for the Thessalonians. He felt strongly attached to them, so much so that he was not only willing to suffer, not only willing to share the gospel with them, but to suffer to share the gospel with them. He was willing to lay down his life for them, to self-sacrifice for their good. Paul, as one commentator put it, was, had a yearning love for the Thessalonians. A yearning desire to be with them like a friend or a lover who longed to be reunited with the object of their love. God give us a love for people. God give us a holy affection for people that will drive us when things get hard and challenging to continue proclaiming the gospel truth and the gospel message. May we give ourselves in service to people for the gospel sake. Living for God, brethren, requires hard work. It requires sacrifice. We will face opposition. We will face adversity. We will face difficulty. But brethren, it will be worth it in the end. It will be worth it after all. God promises to reward those who are all in. God promises to reward those who are fully invested. God is not stingy and he would reward those who are fully invested in the gospel cause. So let us examine our motives for unless we are driven by pure motives, the love of God and the love for people, we won't last. We will flicker out. Our flame will go out. But if we are fueled by the love of God, then we will continue. Ask God, we ask God to pour out his love in our hearts. To help us to love him and to love people so that we will continue to press through in the proclamation of the gospel and living for the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank Reverend Halton Hill for his inspiring message today and we continue to pray for him that God will continue to strengthen him. The hymn of response... Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow, number 91 in the Voices in Praise.
announcements for today. We give thanks to all who continue to support this ministry by viewing and participating actively in the televised services. We remind you that this worship experience is designed to engage you in active worship on screen. As such, we ask that weekly, as the hymns are announced and passages are read, you will also use your hymnals and Bibles to stay engaged. Sing, read the scriptures, and pray with us as you are prompted on screen as if you were in physical worship. For your convenience, we share the orders of service used each time with all who will receive. If you are not already on our mailing list, please request the order at main office at jamaicamethodist.org and you will be added. You may also visit the district website at www.jamaicamethodist.org to download the document. We're grateful to you for your contribution to this ministry and its upkeep on air. Please make note of contact details on screen to make your financial contribution to this effort. We need your support. Let us now give thanks for what we already received and what we anticipate you will offer for this wonderful work. Let us pray. God who provides, we bless your name for your gifts freely given to us. We are ever mindful that what we possess really belongs to you and that we are merely stewards of these tangible gifts in serving others till you return. We thank you for those who continue to share in the work of proclaiming the good news of salvation through television, the internet, and the world wide web by offering of their time, talent, and resources. We ask your blessings on the gifts we have received and those we anticipate. We further ask that you help us all to be faithful and teach us to manage these resources to advance the work of your kingdom. We pray through Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord and Savior, amen. Brothers and sisters, we'll now move into our prayers of intercession. Unifying God, we bring the church before you that you would look with compassion on your church and reconcile all to you. Help us to be relevant and vital to our generation. Make us instruments of peace, reconciliation, and power. Help us to be like Jesus in seeking to care for the vulnerable in our lands. Restoring God, we seek you. Care and restore us to your fullness and repurpose us for your vision. God of islands and mainland territories, we bring the many lands that form the connection and we pray for your restoration and healing to fill our lands. May our leaders be guided to serve the people in ways of justice, fairness, and mercy. Protect our lands against climate change 
earthquakes, and adverse weather conditions. Help us to look to you, to lead us into newness. Restoring God, we seek you. Hear and restore us to your fullness and repurpose us for your mission. God of vision, we bring our youth and young adults before you. We pray that you will provide them with renewed vision and purpose as you restore them to yourself. May they seek to do your will and please you in everything. Extend their boundaries and may they find favor in living lives worthy of the gospel. Restoring God, we seek you. Hear and restore us to your fullness and repurpose us for your mission. Healing God, we pray for your touch and healing upon all who are sick or grieving. May they experience you as the God who restores and revives. May your will be done in the lives of all those who desire you. Restore us to fullness in Christ. Examine us and make us whole in body, mind, and spirit. Restoring God, we seek you. Hear and restore us to your fullness and repurpose us for your mission. God of order, we bring our connectional district circuit and congregational leaders before you. Help them to serve you diligently and your people in this present age. May they live out the purpose you have called them for in this season. May the Methodist Church be revived and on fire for the work of spreading scriptural holiness and living for Jesus in this, the 21st century world. Restoring God, we seek you. Care and restore us to your fullness and repurpose us for your mission. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Or close in him, people of God, rise up. Number 321 in the voices in praise.
We'll now invite Reverend Halton Hill to pronounce the benediction. Receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the full fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.